All right, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another morning of Read Rich and Righteous. Uh, we're reading Rich and Righteous, Spiritual Secrets to Mastering Money, Manifestation in Your Mind. So glad to have you here. We've been here for over two months since uh, mid-November, reading about four to eight pages every single day to make sure that we attune our mind to abundance and we don't get caught up in the collective consciousness and the narrative of scarcity, recession, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it's been a beautiful, beautiful space. Um, we've had over 600 people here on average just joining us uh, for for the, to do this spiritual work before we go out into the world and start pouring into others and doing other people's work as opposed to our own purpose. We're making sure that we tap in because the ultimate goal is to walk in your God-given purpose. And one of the things that stops, one of the biggest things that stops people from doing that is actually um, their money mindset and, and not knowing how money works um, and not knowing the proper or healthiest relationship to money. And so um, I've been able to master that over the past 10 years and um, uh, actually over 13 years now, I've been on my journey of walking in my God-given purpose. I left my job January 9th, 2009 at the bottom of the last recession and um, I was walking on faith, but I had a healthy relationship with money, but more importantly, I had a healthy relationship with my creator. And I knew that if my creator had created me for a purpose, then it would give me everything that I needed to succeed seed at that purpose. And you've been seeing that demonstration in my life through my own personal wealth and through uh, the manifestation of the multifamily movement and the impact that we've been able to have and that we will continue to have as we seek to become the wealthiest family in the world. Yes, you being here actually makes you a part of the wealthiest family in the world. Uh, it hasn't fully manifested yet. This is a 30 to 50 year vision, but I'm seeking to help 100,000 people achieve a million dollars in net worth. Together, that would make us, uh, that, that would be a hundred billion dollars. That would be a hundred billion dollars into Today, that would make us the fifth wealthiest family in the world. And rather than go straight into teaching you a particular asset class uh, through which to build your wealth, what I'm focused on first is reprogramming the subconscious soil of your mind around money so that when the opportunity comes, when you've identified that as asset class, when you've identified your purpose, your blessing model and your business model, you can actually receive the abundance that is your birthright. And so we know that Matthew 6, 33, one of our favorite scriptures is that seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And so rather than seeking these things first and then trying to walk in our purpose, what we're trying to do is get clear on what God has for us in terms of work to do, right? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so we're trying to figure out what is our labor? What is our work here in the earthly realm? And then once we get clear on that and we align our lives with that in righteousness, then we know that all the things that we uh, desire shall be added unto us. We don't focus on our personal selfish vision boards here. Instead, we focus on our give vision board. Who am I here to give vision to? Who am I here to light the way for? And once I get clear on that, then I know that everything that I would want on my personal vision board will come to me. That has been my demonstration. They don't teach that in the secret. They just say, go cut out the car and the house and the guy and the girl that you want. Put that on your vision board and just focus on that every single day. Those are selfish needs, right? And when you pray, uh, you have not because you ask not or you ask with false motives. And so uh, we are um, going back to the source. We're going back to scripture, um, scripture that has been around for thousands, thousands of years to guide us. And we're actually reading it for ourselves. We're not taking other people's iterations or interpretations of it, but we're actually reading it for ourselves. And for me, this book is a combination of the Bible, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, As a Man Thinketh, and Think and Grow Rich all in one. And um, this book helps you uncover the financial aspects and lessons that are in uh, the, the Bible. And so um, that's why each chapter begins with a, uh, a scripture, and um, we're going to continue our reading today um, on page 246. We're on page 246 right now. We're on page 246 right now, and um, we're reading the six forms of capital for creation. This is the longest section in the book. Uh, we will break it up over three days, so um, it, it will be here Tuesday. We'll go through it Tuesday, which is today, uh, Wednesday, and Thursday, um, because it is the longest section in the book. But it's really important for you to understand this section and the six forms of capital, because these are the resources that God has given us in order to create more financial resource, which is financial capital. And so we're going to walk through those today and um, continue our journey. So we're going to do about five pages today. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we want to welcome you. Um, again, we are reading Rich and Righteous, my book, Spiritual Secrets and Mastering Money Manifestation in Your Mind. Um, if you would like to get a copy of the book, uh, it is pinned um, on the top or at the bottom at, on YouTube and Instagram. You can go to moneyandmanifestation.com. Again, that's moneyandmanifestation.com. Um, and uh, 
and you can get it there. If you go to Amazon, it is $100 for one copy. But if you go to moneymanifestation.com, I'll actually give you five copies for $100. Plus, you get the Rituals Workbook and the audio book. Uh, the reason I do that, it is particularly structured that way. A lot of people say, Julian, can I just buy one book? No. It is intentionally done that way to stimulate your personal economy. By giving you four extra books, I'm putting you in an immediate state of giving. Because as you give, so you shall receive. So to stimulate your personal economy, you have to give more. The reason you're not receiving the financial wealth that you desire is because you're not giving at the greatest level that you could give, right? And so if we know that that law exists, then we need to give more. But we, uh, as, as, as the righteous, we are by default givers. And what we're learning here through reading Rich and Righteous is um, how to become better receivers. But the righteous, we receive so that we can give. So we don't receive just to store this and let it sit dormant and, and dead in our bank accounts. We receive so that we can give more, right? And so this is an ongoing cycle and it will just get bigger and bigger and bigger and your ripple and your impact on this world will get bigger and bigger and bigger as you master not only the giving function, which is by default who you are, but also the receiving function as well. And that's where your blessing model, which is how you give and your business model, which is how you receive, which we discussed, uh, I think yesterday, um, come into play. All right. So I'm going to welcome you. Um, if Instagram uh, acts up, uh, you can come join us on YouTube. If Instagram acts up for any reason, you can come join us on YouTube. If YouTube acts up for any reason, please go join us on Instagram. All right. So um, uh, if you can take a moment really quickly to like and share this video, this is the best way we know how to break these algorithms. Um, and it's through human interaction. And so I see about 250 people here on YouTube. Uh, we have about 110 likes right now. If you go ahead and like this video and share it um, on Instagram, I think you can see a heart um, and you can see an arrow. So please, please uh, share this video um, and this reading with as many people as possible so that we can change collective consciousness together. All right. So uh, with that, we are on page 246. We're on page 246, and um, we are reading the six forms of capital for creation, all right? His, and remember, um, you see his divine power is in the scripture, right? But remember, um, there was this was a, these were men who translated these books or somehow received these divine downloads. And so in the Jewish language, there's no neuter. So in the Jewish language, you have to use he or hers, right? There's no it. Um, so... What happens is you'll see that the translator or whoever got the download used their own gender. God is not just masculine. So ladies out there, you have to be really uh, you have to be really cautious of just calling God the father. Right. Because we know that if as above, so below, we know that everything on Earth requires the feminine in order for creation to occur. So if you go back to Genesis, it said, let us let us create man, not man as in a gender, as in mankind, right, in our own image. And oftentimes in the Bible where you see uh, a man and a woman, it is really allegory to e explain the masculine and the feminine. When we're talking about the masculine and the feminine, we're not talking about gender. When we're talking about the masculine and the feminine, we're not talking about gender. Men have feminine in them. You have your mother in you. Women have masculine in them, right? You have your father in you. And so you see uh, these conversations online about women being too masculine or men being too feminine now and things of that nature. Why? Because those natures, both natures are inside of us. But when you misunderstand masculine and feminine as being referred to as specifically gender, that's where we get it wrong. Masculine and feminine is in all of us. And we have to find where we sit on that pendulum. Perhaps a biological man is supposed to sit more on the masculine side, but not ignore the feminine and his mother that is in him. And perhaps woman is supposed to sit on more of the feminine side, but not ignore the father that is in her, right? And so we have to find where we sit on that pendulum um, between the masculine and the feminine, right? And so um, uh, this is why you hear me say, mother, father, God. I do not just acknowledge God as the father, because now I think of God as some big man in the sky. No. I say mother, father, God, because we know that the feminine must be there for the creation process to unfold. Right. And so um, we have all these uh, all these um, uh, single women in churches um, just re referring to this minister that this is, is this man or God, the father. Right. Because father wasn't it. And, and it really takes really strongly, because if you came from a home where there was no biological father, then it's so easy to just reach out to this heavenly father. 
I don't need a dad. My heavenly father is there. Okay. But you have a heavenly mother too. Okay. You have a heavenly mother too. And the way I think of them is as one entity and one being. I don't think of them as separate, right? Your mother and father biologically may be separate, but I don't think about God being the separate being. God is the all. God is the all. God is all aspects, right? God is all aspects. The devil is not, the quote unquote devil is not some separate entity outside of God. God is all. So you can't say that God is all, but then there's this other entity that God is fighting against, right? Light and dark, they're all part of one spectrum. Darkness is simply the absence of light. And so when you start to see the oneness, because what actually occurred in the garden was this split, knowledge of good and evil. That was the actual split of duality. And that's where we started thinking about life in this either or way, in this me, them against them way, this against this, right against wrong, right? So this is where we started to fall off is when we weren't able to see the oneness, we weren't able to see things as yin and yang, that they were all part of one, but you may be experiencing a certain aspect of that one, all right? So um, so here in this scripture, 2 Peter 1, 3, which we're opening up with, it says his. I just wanted that word, I could I could just bypass that right now and just say, oh yeah, his. And that just, that just continues the programming that you have that God is only man and that God is the father. So I just needed to correct that. I have to correct that. So his or its divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him or it who called us by its own glory and goodness. OK, so I'm going to read it as we're using the word it. OK, its divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of it who called us by its own glory and goodness. That's second Peter one three. All right. All right. So we're on page 246. Many people think that they need something outside of themselves to have what they want to have. When God has given you everything you need to succeed, while it is powerful when two or more people are gathered initially, you don't need anyone else to achieve what you want to achieve. There is no external gatekeeper, only the mental gates you have closed that keep you limited. If you have ever had a, the thought nobody supports me, I would challenge you by asking, is that true? How many of you have ever had the thought, nobody supports me? Nobody helping me? I would challenge you by asking, is that true? Have you called everyone in your phone contacts to tell them about what you are up to? There, are, there may be one contact among your social capital that you could open up financial, open up the open the financial floodgates for you. So we say these blanket statements, nobody, all, never, nobody supports me. Well, you haven't asked everybody that's in your phone. So how do you know that it's true that nobody supports you? If you asked all the hundred contacts in your phone, would they all say no to whatever it is that you were up to? If one person says yes, then you cannot accurately say that nobody supports me. You are lying. What is really happening is that your self doubt hasn't your self doubt isn't allowing you to reach out to people, right? You expected people to just naturally support you. You expected your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your spouse, your friends to naturally support you, and they should. I agree that they should, but sometimes they don't. And so, just off of the two or three people you told about what you're up to, saying no or not getting behind you, all of a sudden you've made this blanket statement that nobody supports me. That's a lie. You haven't asked enough people to support you. Everybody doesn't support this vision that I have. There are people who have said no. There are people who I've tried to hire who chose employment elsewhere. There are people who I've asked to volunteer. There's people who I've invited into this community said, no, that's not for me. But I don't make this blanket statement that nobody supports me. The fact that even one of you is here right now means that somebody supports me. And therefore, the blanket statement of nobody or all people or never, I can't use that. Some of us just jump into victim consciousness. Oh, I asked my friend if they would help me and they said, no, oh, nobody is here to help me. Some of us just jump into victim consciousness. But really what that is, it's lack of belief in yourself. It's not that your mom doesn't believe in you. It's not that your dad doesn't believe in you. It's not that your spouse doesn't believe in you. It's not that your friends that don't believe in you. It's what they're seeing is that you don't believe in you and you are externalizing that lack of belief in yourself in them. 
They don't believe because you don't believe. They don't see the belief in you. How many ideas have you come with to them with when you started and then two weeks later you fell off? How many ideas have you come to them with that you did not fully commit to, that you gave up on? And you expect them to believe in you on the next idea? Now, as a loving parent, if my daughter, Jada, comes to me with an idea, she says, Daddy, I want to learn the piano. I'm going to go get a piano or a keyboard. And if she falls off, she falls off. As a loving father, she, I wait for the next thing. Daddy, I want to learn this. Okay, let's go get this stuff to do that. So as, a, as your spirit, I'm not your spiritual father, but um, as a spiritual, as God, God, God is always going to be there to support you, right? Even if man, biological man, physical man and woman is not there to support you, your heavenly mother, father, God is always there waiting for you to show up with that next idea. But what has to happen is that you have to commit. It is done unto you as you believe, not as other people believe. It doesn't matter what your mom believes. It doesn't matter what your dad believes. It doesn't matter what your significant other believes. It is done unto you as you believe. Okay, so. The, those characters in our lives are actually projections from our own mind, reflecting back to us our own lack of belief in ourselves. We still on page one, y'all. We ain't even out the first paragraph. <laughs> All right, let's go. I would challenge you by asking, is that true? Have you called everyone in your phone contact to tell them about what you're up to? There may be one contact among your social capital that could open the financial floodgates for you. Instead of thinking, I don't have everything I need, consider asking yourself, have I used everything I already have? I need everybody to type that question in. Have I used everything I already have? Have I used everything I already have? I need everybody to type that question in. Have I used everything? I already have. Have I used everything I already have? When you ran out of toilet paper during COVID, what did you use? <laughs> you went and found some paper towels, right? When you ran out of toilet paper during COVID, oh, shit, I ain't got no more toilet paper and the grocery store is closed. I'm sure you found something that you already had. <laughs> Have I used everything I already have? <laughs> you know, we're going to make this journey to freedom fun, family. I'm Corny, by the way. Hello, my name is Corny, and um, I have Corny jokes. And the thing I love about Corny jokes is that you either laugh at them or you laugh at me. Either way, you laugh. It. And laughter and joy is a childlike vibration, and it is a good thing. So I don't care. I have enough security in myself for you to laugh at me. So whether you're laughing at me or laughing with me, it's all good. All right. Cool. So let's keep it pushing. <laughs> um, instead of thinking, I don't have everything I need, consider asking yourself, have I used everything I already have? Right. If you didn't have what you needed, you would be permanently stuck until something outside of yourself freed you. If you didn't have what you needed, you would be permanently stuck until something outside of yourself freed you. By assuming that you must, listen, by assuming that you must have everything you need to get to the next step, okay? not You may not have everything you need to build out the full house, to build out the full vision, but if you look carefully, you have everything you need to get to the next step. It causes you to look at what you do have instead of what you think uh, what, what you don't think you have, and to he who has, more shall be given, Mark 4, 25. To he who has, more shall be given. So you need to look carefully around you, and the way I'm going to teach you how to look is through the six forms of capital. I'm going to teach you how to look at the six forms of capitals, what's around you to build that which you want. I've categorized what you already have into the six forms of capital to help you appreciate the abundance that is already within you and around you. As an asset alchemist, the way you put these six forms of capital together can help you manifest anything you desire. So everybody, please type asset alchemist. Everybody, please type asset alchemist. 
please type asset alchemist. You are taking these various assets that are around you, that are within you, and that you have access to, right? And you are asset alchemist. An alchemist takes a base material and turns it into something richer, something turns it into something more valuable, okay? So you are an asset alchemist. I am an asset alchemist, okay? The only assets are not real estate. As much as I love real estate, that is not the greatest asset. The greatest asset is me. The greatest asset is my mind. The greatest asset is my connection to source. These are the greatest assets, okay? So the first form of capital that we're going to get into today is personal capital, okay? Personal capital is how well you know. Your, and before I go there, there are some times, listen to me. There are some times where you have to go out of sight of yourself to get what you need. In the same way that sometimes a car needs a jump from another car, okay? Sometimes a car needs a jump or a push from people to get it to the gas station, right? To get it going again. Sometimes, okay? We never want to rely on that permanently. Sometimes a heart needs a defibrillator to get it going again. It needs something outside of itself to get it going again. But we never want to rely on that outside thing permanently. You do not want to have to use a defibrillator every single day to get going again. You do not want to have to get a car jump every single day to get your car started. So there are some temporary moments when we're really down and out where we do need something or somebody outside of ourselves to get us started. But we never want to create a codependent relationship with that entity or that individual. Okay. Some of you are in codependent relationships right now. Somebody came into your life at a point of vulnerability and weakness, and they got you started again. And now you're holding on to them permanently when the reality is, is that they were only supposed to be there for that specific moment. Think about that. Somebody came at a moment when you were vulnerable or weak and they got you started again. And now you have to ask, now that you're back on your feet, you need to ask, was this perm, am, am I in a codependent relationship with this person because of how they helped me in a time of need? And am I holding on to that for the permanence of that feeling? Or was that person just supposed to be there for that particular period of time? And now we can have a different form of relationship that this does not have to go towards romance. You need to pray on that. I can't give you the answer. God, is this person supposed to be in my life permanently or were they supposed to be there temporarily to support me to get back on my feet? Because if they're only supposed to be there temporarily, but you're holding on to them permanently, you will find that that a relationship erodes really fast. It'll be an unhealthy relationship, not because of anything that they did, but because of you holding on to something that was not meant to be in your life forever, that you were not supposed to rely on forever. You were only supposed to rely on it to get you back on your feet. You need to pray on that. If you started a relationship from a place of weakness and vulnerability, you need to pray on that. I don't care how long it's been. If that is the foundation of your relationship, you need to pray on that. Okay? So we're on page 247. <laughs> Charlotte said, don't create a permanent relationship with your defibrillator. <laughs> Do not create a permanent relationship with your defibrillator, <laughs> okay? Cool, we're on page 247. We're on personal capital right now. Personal capital is how well you know yourself. Personal capital uh, is when anyone, when anyone looks at you, they can't see your capital because your personal capital lives where? It lives inside of you. It's the reason people want you on their team to be and to be associated with you because you're a great listener, you're wise, or you have great ideas. It's the reason your friends want to be around, uh, want you around them because you're very caring, you're insightful, or because you're joyful and genuine. Your personal capital is made up of the inward characteristics that make you attracted to others internally, not externally. We're not talking about external attraction. Anytime we're talking about the law of attraction, we're not talking about how you physically appear, okay? We're talking about your internal attraction. What's magnetic about who you are, right? What's magnetic about who you are? You know, if you look at the world's wealthiest people, 
are they the most beautiful people physically? Are the world's wealthiest people the most beautiful people physically? No. What Jay Z say? I'm a billionaire. I'm cute, or something like that. But you start looking at them. Oh, why? Because you see their inner attraction. You see the inner attraction that allowed them to attract everything that they have, and so now it starts to change your perception of who they are and how they look. Right? Oh, Jay Z ain't that bad. You wouldn't have dated Jay Z in high school. Let's just keep it real. You wouldn't have dated Jay Z in high school. You wouldn't. He would have been like, look at his big nose. And he'll say that. I'm not talking about Jay-Z negatively. He'd have been like, he got a big old nose. But now, but now, <laughs> we're not looking for a visual match. We're looking for a vibrational match. In the dating realm, you're not looking for a visual match. You're looking for a vibrational match. And what you'll find is when you find somebody who's a vibrational match, guess what? you'll start looking at them visually as beautiful. When you find somebody who's a vibrational match, because where is beauty? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So you look for the vibrational match first, and you're not looking with your two eyes. You're feeling the vibrational match between someone. And as that match comes, your visual perception of them will change. Okay? Okay. Page 247, second paragraph. <laughs> your personal capital includes your awareness of your gifts, talents, strengths, weaknesses, purpose, passion, interests, and habits. So when we say, uh, who am I? Or know thyself, this is what we're talking about. It also has to do with knowing what type of environments, motivators, and people you work well with and which ones you don't. Knowing thyself is the key to success. In the Gospel of Thomas, which is a book that they took out of the Bible, okay? The Gospel of Thomas. They took it out of the Bible. Why? Because it's so powerful. If it was in the Bible, amongst the Gospels, it would be the most powerful Gospel. But they took it out because it revealed too much truth. Okay? So in the Gospel of Thomas, and there are many books that were taken out of the Bible, through the Council of Nicaea, they chose which books were going to go in and which books were going to go out. Man made that decision. The Roman Empire made that decision. God didn't make that decision. Man made that decision. So now you look at this canonized Bible when it was actually men who made that decision. And so now any book that's outside of the Bible, you don't take it as God's word. But you've read books in your life where you know God was speaking through that author. In fact, you're reading a book right now that you know God was speaking through the author. This should not be my name right here. I do that because we're in the earthly realm, but this was a divine download to me and through me. But so now you only look at this book as the word of God, that's what they told you. This is the word of God. When you get the word, the word of God can come through you at any time and anywhere from anyone, anyway. The word of God can come to you through a homeless man on the street. The word of God existed before the Bible ever existed. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, the Bible wasn't there. In the beginning was the word. The Bible was not there in the beginning. So how could the Bible be the only word of God? God is always speaking to us. The question is, are we listening? And if they controlled you so much that you believe that you can only hear God through this book and through this church, then this is why you feel cut off. This is why you feel in darkness. They've told you that the only way to God is through them, through the church, through this book, through the Bible. Blatant lies, family. So how are people getting to God before the Bible existed, before writing even existed, before they started printing the Bible in mass? How would people get to God if they couldn't have access to the word of God? Because of, in the beginning was the word. God has always been communicating to us through vibration, through how we feel about a certain decision, how we feel about a certain person, how we feel about a certain situation. God is always communicating to us. The question is, are we listening? Do we have an, are we attuned enough? to that higher power, to that source, to actually move in alignment with it. If you continue to move in alignment with God, you will never fail. It is when we go against what we know and feel is right that we end up in painful situations. And that pain, guess what? It's really just pushing us back towards pleasure. It's really just pushing us back towards alignment. Nobody did that to you but you. With the exception of 
situations in childhood where you were not in control, where an adult may have taken advantage of you or somebody using a weapon may have taken advantage of you, the other situations in your life, if you look back and retrace your steps in your mind, at some point you decided to go the opposite way that you know you were supposed to go. But we don't want to take personal accountability. We never want to say, oh, it was me. I actually heard God tell me or I felt God tell me go left and I chose to go right because of the visual, because of what these two eyes were showing me. But my heart, my body was saying, go this way. Don't do that. Say no. But I went against myself. I went against the God in me. Knowing thyself is the key to success. In the Gospel of Thomas, a book left out of the Canaanized Bible, it reads, and the kingdom of God is inside of you. Whoever knows himself will discover this. And when you come to know yourself, you will realize that you are sons of the living father. But if you will not know yourselves, you will dwell in poverty. And it is you who are that poverty. <laughs> I'm going to repeat that again because they won't teach this in church. And the kingdom of God is inside of you. We know that Luke 17, um, 21 also says that the kingdom of God is within you. Okay. Book of Thomas. Thomas just expands on that. Okay. And the kingdom of God is inside of you. Whoever knows himself will discover this. And when you come to know yourselves, you will realize that you are sons and daughters of the living father or mother father. But if you will not know yourself, this is if you choose not to know yourself, you will dwell in poverty, which is the external condition. Why? Because it is you who are that poverty. You are the poverty because you don't know yourself. This is why personal capital is so important. You must know yourself. It's not this blanket, vague statement. It is the awareness of your gifts, your talents, your strengths, your weaknesses, your purpose, your passion, your interests, and your habits. This is you knowing yourself. If I quizzed you on those things right now, most of you would fail. Most of you don't know what your purpose is. You don't know what your passions are. You don't know what your strengths are. You don't know what your talents are. You cannot, if I quizzed you for 10 minutes right now, what is your purpose? What are your passions? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Most of you would fail at that test, but yet you got a perfect score on the SAT. Yet you got a 4.0 GPA in college and in graduate school. But when I ask you questions about who you are, you can't answer them. There weren't many classes on college campuses to help you understand who you are. And most employers simply may not care who you are because they just want to mold you into who they need you to be. Oftentimes, you have to explore these things outside of traditional education systems and work on them on your own through personal development classes, coaching, and challenging yourself. In ancient Kemet, today known as Egypt, the foundation of modern day education, above the entrance of many temples, appeared the phrase, man, know thyself. Man, know thyself. Man as in mankind, family. When you hear the word man in the Bible, think mankind or think masculine, okay? The word educate comes from the Latin word educare, which means to mold to or train or educere, which means to lead out. The education system has primarily been built on the first definition, right? Which is to mold or to train, right? Now it is time for the second meaning to come to the forefront if you are going to be at the forefront of your own life. Training is importing the ways of the world into you. When somebody is training you, they are importing the ways of the world into you. Knowledge of self is how you export who you are into the world. I'm gonna underline that. Listen to me. When you are being trained and educated in the public school system, training is importing the existing ways of the world into you. I am in the world, but I am not of the world. Knowledge of self is how you export who you are into the world. So training is them programming your mind with what they want you to think. Knowledge of self is exporting who you are into the world. We need more exporting, family.
We need more exporting of who you are into the world. We need more exporting of your divinity. We need ex more exporting of your gifts and your talents and your strengths and your passion. We need more exporting. But if they keep training you and keep importing, right, then that means that you are consuming and you are not creating. Importing is consumption, right? And this is why so many Americans are consumers. Exporting is creation. It's the creation process. And I am a child of God. I am a child of the creator. So guess what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to create. And I only consume so that I can create. I only consume what I need so that I can keep on creating. I don't consume just indefinitely, just keep on consuming, buy this, buy this, everything that I like, I just buy, 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 buy. No, I'm a child of the creator. Therefore, I'm supposed to create. That's what I'm here to do. That's my primary reason for being here. I'm here to export, not to import. If I import, then I just repeat the pattern of the world. You wonder why history keeps repeating itself is because we have more importers. We have more consumers. This is why history keeps repeating itself because this you're a clone of your, your, your mother and father and your mother and father are a clone of your grandfather and grandmother. And they're a clone because they were just importers. They just got the world imported and programmed into them. Nothing new came out of them except for you. As spiritual beings having a human experience, we are meant to be in the world, but not of it. Okay. Page 248, second paragraph. With personal capital, there is a caveat, which is that your personal capital often comes so naturally to you that you don't even recognize that it's a gift. You think that everyone can do what you do. We think I can breathe, so everyone else must be able to breathe too. I can write poetically, and I assume that everyone else can do it too. It is not until somebody holds up a mirror to you and says, that was amazing, or how did you do that? That you start to recognize that you have a unique ability in a particular area. What comes easily and naturally to you may seem like rocket science to everyone around you. Listen for that feedback because it is a sign that you have personal capital that you will likely want to build your life around. Your gifts, talents, and strengths come so naturally to you, you think everybody around you can do it until you realize that they can't, until they start looking at you like, how did you make that meal, right? How did you put together that presentation? How do you speak so eloquently on stage? Did you go to Toastmasters? No, just, how do you sing like that? Anytime people reflect that back to you, I need you to write it down. Don't just brush that off because that is the gift, talent, and strength and the form of capital that you want to base your life around. That is valuable knowledge about who you are and what makes you unique. Page 248, bottom paragraph. Knowing thyself also means that your conditions of, knowing what your conditions of success are, okay? You are the guard inner of your mind. Everybody type guard hyphen inner, okay? Not gardener. I want you to type guard as in I stand guard, hyphen inner. And we're going to get into that later on um, in the book. Guard hyphen inner. Guard. I am the guard inner of my mind. I guard my inner. I guard my inner. That's, <laughs> that's what it means, family. I'm guarding my inner. You are the guard inner of your mind, but you also have the power to shape your external environment too. In other words, what types of environments do you thrive in? You have to know this, family. You have to know what types of environment you thrive in. Pineapple trees don't grow in Alaska. That isn't their optimal environment. If you were to try to plant a pineapple tree in Alaska and it didn't grow, you may be inclined to blame the seed when in fact it was the soil and surrounding. The reason some of you aren't thriving in the jobs you have because that's not the environment you're supposed to be in and you keep forcing it. You are a good seed, but you are a plant. You have planted yourself because you made the choice. You have planted yourself in bad soil. It's not bad soil for everyone. It's just bad soil for the seed that you are. So you will never reap there. You will never thrive there, but you are the one who planted yourself there. You are the one who chose to be there. Nobody held a gun up to your head and said, you have to be here. You wanted to force your way in there. You have planted yourself in soil that is not for you. 
So it's not only awareness of who you are, you also must have the awareness of where you're supposed to be. So don't blame, don't look at yourself negatively. Why am I thriving here? Why am I not growing here? No, I'm a good seed. I am a good seed, okay? But the, and I'm not even blaming the environment because I chose to be in this environment. There are seeds who will thrive in this environment. I'm just not one of them. So my role and responsibility now is to go find fertile soil that is good for me, period. That is your job, nobody else's. So don't blame your employer. Stop blaming your employer. Stop saying, I hate my job. No, say, I hate the soil I planted myself in. We're taking full responsibility right now. We Type that in right now. I hate the soil that I planted myself in. Put that. Stop saying I hate my job. I hate my boss. I hate the soil that I planted myself in. And I, I, I rarely use the word hate. And it's not that the soil is bad because that soil is good for certain types of seeds. But I'm asking you to take personal responsibility for the fact that you have allowed yourself to stay in soil that you will never thrive in. Now that we started out with an I statement, now we can say, oh, I also have the power to replant myself in new soil. I need you to type that in. I have the power to replant myself in new soil. I have the power to plant myself in new soil. I'm not mad at this soil. There are seeds who are thriving here. This is good soil for some. It is not good soil for me. And I have the power to plant myself in new soil where I will thrive, where I will bear a hundredfold. And if you can't find a pot of soil or a company to plant yourself in, then guess what that means? That At that point, that means that you are likely meant to be an entrepreneur. That At that point, if you cannot find fertile soil that is perfectly matched for your seed that you are, the seed that you are, to thrive, then that likely means that you are meant to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody's meant to be an entrepreneur. I'm not encouraging that. Only if you cannot find soil that will allow you to thrive at your highest level and produce the most fruit, good fruit. If you were trying to plant a pineapple tree in Alaska and it didn't grow, you may be inclined to blame the seed when in fact it was the soil and surroundings. The seed is you and there is nothing wrong with the seed in the same way that there is nothing wrong with you. The soil is your environment or your mind. And your surroundings are the things outside of you that you can't always control, but that you can notice either help you or hurt you. For instance, do you thrive best when you are working alone or on teams? Are you more focused when you are in a log cabin or in a brainstorming group? Can you virtually or can you uh, can virtual work work for you or do you need to be in the same room with people? Are you an early bird or a night owl? How do you show up when you meditate and exercise in the morning versus when you don't? How is the clarity of your thinking when your house is messy? What types of foods give you the most energy? Are you more excited when you are considering the larger vision or digging through small details? How much sun do you need? Do you like being front stage or backstage? Do you communicate best through writing, speech, or visuals? Do you feel better in warm climates or cold ones? Do you like autonomy or authority? How often do you need feedback? Are you motivated by competition, metrics, money, or are you self-motivated? All of these questions speak to the environment and the environment, envir environmental conditions, which are the ones inside of you, and the environmental conditions, which are outside of you, of success that allow you to be at your best. And your answers reveal how well you know yourself. Your answers reveal how well you know yourself. Many of you don't know. And so you need to run experiments. Man, when I get enough sun, when I get enough vitamin D, y'all need to get your heads out the gutter. I'm not talking about that version, okay? When I get enough vitamin D, this is how I show up. <laughs> I know you. I know what some of y'all are thinking. Get your heads out the gutter. <laughs> when I get enough vitamin D, this is how I show up. <laughs> When I eat the right foods, this is how I show up. When I'm in teams, this is how I show up. 
when I am front stage, this is how I show up. When I'm backstage, this is how I show up. When I am working on something in the morning, this is how I show up. When I'm trying to work on something at night, this is how I show up. You need to start observing these things, okay? So, um, man, <laughs> we're only three pages in. All right, let me get through intellectual capital. I wanted to get to 252. All right, y'all got me preaching out here. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have fun, y'all. They cut you off from your sexuality, by the way. Religion cuts you off from your sexuality, and that's one of the most powerful forms of creation. And I don't just mean sex, I mean your sexual energy from your root chakra. They cut you off from it. They demonized it when that is the exact portal that you came through. That's exactly how you got here, and they want to demonize it. All right. We are on page 249. Two, intellectual capital. This is what you know. What you know. Okay. Intellectual capital is what you know. This includes your expertise in one or two subject or skills. When you walk into any room, what subject would you feel comfortable speaking on in front of anyone for an hour? So let's say you walked into a room of 1,000 people and you don't even know who's in the room. What subject would you feel comfortable going on stage and speaking on with power for one hour? People have master's degrees and never mastered anything. Some of y'all got master's degrees and haven't mastered a damn thing. You couldn't, at graduation, you couldn't even speak on what you mastered in, what you majored in for one hour because all you did was pass some tests. You got a master's degree and still ain't got no mastery because all you were focused on was a damn piece of paper. And this is why you in debt. Because you didn't seek mastery. If you would have sought mastery, you wouldn't be in debt. If you are a master at anything, you would not be in debt in the way that you are. But you wanted the piece of paper. You wanted the three words to put on. You wanted to put the university name on your resume. That's what you paid $60,000 for is to put a university name and master's. And you wanted to put five words on your resume and you pay $60,000 for that. That's what you pay $60,000 for. Because you haven't mastered anything. When you walk into any room, what subject would you feel comfortable speaking on in front of anyone for an hour? Or what skill can you do well and replicate success more than the average person? The only reason Steph Curry gets paid what he gets paid because he can make a three-point shot and replicate that success more than anyone in the world. Now, I, as an open shooter, my three-point shooting ability when I'm practicing is around 50%. I can make half my shots open, okay, when I'm practicing. He can make 80%. That 30% difference is the reason why he gets paid 50, 50 million plus a year, and I don't make any money off of basketball. It's only a 30% difference, okay? Actually, he's probably more like 90% wide open, (laughs) okay? So 40% difference, but that is that little subtle difference. Him making nine out of 10 and me only being able to make five out of 10 is the difference between millions of dollars. By the end of his basketball career, that's a billion dollar difference right there. The fact that he can make nine out of 10 and I can only make five out of 10 at my best. That's a billion dollar difference right there. He can replicate success more than me, okay? Even if you went to college and graduated with a major and minor doesn't mean that you have any intellectual capital. For most people, their major didn't matter. If you stop college graduates on a stage at graduation and ask them to lecture for one hour on what their diploma says they majored in, most couldn't do it, which means they have no intellectual capital. They got an expensive six-figure piece of paper but have nothing to show for it. Do you realize, family, that for those of you who have your diplomas on your wall, you realize that the mahogany frame that you spent $150 at the bookstore for is worth more than the actual piece of paper inside the frame? If you went to a pawn shop and said, here's my diploma frame and here's my diploma, which one are you gonna get more money for? 
the mahogany frame is worth more than the actual piece of paper in the frame that you're trying to protect. It's the biggest scam in the world. It's the biggest scam in the world. I chose violence this morning. No, I chose transformation. I chose transfiguration. I chose upliftment. I chose empowerment. I chose self-accountability. I chose love. Yes, yeah, tough love. I don't choose violence. Never choose violence. I hope you know that this is all coming from a place of love. I want you to achieve your highest self. I want you to reach your God state. I want you to be in perfect alignment with the creator. I don't know what that looks like when we have hundreds of people, thousands of people in alignment with the creator, but I know it's I know it's closer to heaven on earth than what we're experiencing right now. I don't know what you're going to create when you are in perfect alignment. I just know that it'd be good and that it'd be great. That the world that my daughter will grow up in will be better because all of these people are in alignment with their God-given purpose and gifts and walk. Yeah, that's, that's what I do know. I don't know what it's going to look like. My mind, my conscious mind can't even conceive of it. But I just know that thousands of soldiers in alignment is going to lead to a better world, period. So that's why I'm here. All right. Page 250. We in our whole season, our heaven on earth season. If you missed that, we in our whole season. H-O-E, heaven on earth. We are in perfect alignment. Not the sexual whole season. We're in the spiritual whole season. Heaven on earth. That is what we are seeking to experience every single day. I'm not procreating, but I'm creating like a pro. I'm not procreating, but I'm creating like a pro family. <laughs> I'm creating like my mother, father, God creates. I'm just going to look to them for my model. I'm going to look to it for my model. How do I create? I'm creating like a pro. Any divine idea that comes to me, pff, manifest. There's no manifestation without man. All right. Page 250, second paragraph. As professionals, we start developing skills related to our jobs, but the risk is getting great at what you hate. Oh my goodness. Listen very carefully, family. As professionals, we start developing skills related to our jobs, but the risk is getting great at what you hate. When you get great at something you hate, you attract more of it. Some of you have been getting great on your job and what's happening? Now that you're great at this thing that you hate, you're only attracting more of it. Instead, you might as well focus on getting great at what you want to be great at. The time commitment will be equal. I'm sure you've heard, uh, you've heard of the 10,000 hour rule in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. It takes approximately 10,000 hours to truly master something. Mastery doesn't come passively. It is deliberate. You have to be intentional about any skill or subject you want to master. The beautiful thing about seeking mastery is that not only do you master the skill or subject, you also master the process of mastery and you master yourself along the way. So when you seek mastery, you master the skill, you master the process of mastery, and you master yourself. This is the, this is the threefold impact of master, choosing to master something deliberately. The skill you master, the process of mastery you master, and yourself. Okay. Think about it. When somebody masters one instrument there or one language, it is actually easier for them to master another one because they've mastered themselves. They know how to discipline themselves when it's time to learn and they have mastered the process of mastery. So you'll see that a piano player knows how to play the trumpet, the flute, this, the drum, et cetera, because they're taking the initial mastery of the first instrument or the first language, and they're simply applying the same process to the next and the next and the next, okay? So I need you to commit to mastering something. Money follows mastery, but people want the interest without making the investment. Financially, interest is the money you get as a result of an investment. Interest attracts you but you can only get it through making the investment of money come and committing to mastery. You can't want a million dollars out 
when you haven't put 10,000 hours in. Y'all keep showing up at the slot machine trying to get a million dollars out when you haven't put that much in. As you give, so you shall receive. I'm not asking you to put a million dollars in the machine to only get a million out. You're putting in your time, your thought, energy, right? And your physical energy into something to get a greater return. You reap what you sow. If you haven't discovered what your interests, what interests you yet, I've found that anything you were heavily invested in will become interesting. One of my favorite examples of interest is George Washington Carver. He has over 200, I believe over 200 patents on just the peanut. The peanut is this basic little thing, but he was so invested in it that his interest developed. He was so invested in getting everything he could out of this peanut from oils to lotions to ointments, right? He was so invested in the peanut, it became interesting to him. Some of you have these surface level interests, but what I'm asking you to do is to take your interest downward into depth. The most boring thing in the world that you think is boring has a deep level of interest if you choose to go down. If you only look at it on a surface level, you'll be stuck right there. But I'm asking you to take your interest and go down into the depth of something. In the same way that George Washington Carver went into the depths of the peanut, he understood the peanut, the little old peanut that we might just eat, take off the shell, eat the peanuts and throw it out. We think nothing of it. He saw something in it and his investment in it increased his interest. Okay. Don't wait passively for an interest to find you. Invest until you find something interesting. In a moment, I will show you how to discover your passion using the Passion Finder. So this is going to be the last page that we read uh, today. Okay. I know we've gone a little bit long. Y'all put me in the pulpit today. All right. Page 251. This is um, the skills values matrix. Take a screenshot of this. Take a screenshot of this. If you do not have the book, take a screenshot of this. This is why I need some of y'all to get the book because visuals like this um, are in the book. And even if I'm reading it to you, you can't see this visual. Okay. This is the skills values matrix. This is what I'm about to break down for you. Below is the skills values matrix. It will help you identify where all of your skills fit in terms of the value ladder. The vertical spectrum measures how easily or how hard a skill is to master. The horizontal spectrum measures how many people have the skill. I've only found one skill that many people have that is also difficult to do, and that is giving birth. So shout out to all the ladies that are here. Unfortunately, you don't get paid for that unless you give birth to other people's children as a surrogate mom for $25,000 or more. You have skills, but most of them are likely in the lower half of the matrix, meaning that you won't be able to capture a ton of value for them. It's competitive and cutthroat below the line. It's the basic economics of supply and demand. The more people that can do something increases the supply, and without the demand changing, the lower the price or value of that skill will be. So here we have in the skills value matrix, right? In the skills value matrix, we have... Lots of people can do it. Very few people can do it. We have very easy to learn. We have very difficult to learn or master, okay? So there's very few things that fit in, very difficult, but lots of people can do it. The only thing that fits there is really giving birth, okay? So shout out to all the ladies. Now, here, lots of people can do it, and it's very easy, navigating social media, okay? Many of you are watching on social media right now. Navigating social media is easy, so it's very hard to get paid for just navigating social media. But if we go over here to very few people can do it, and yet it's still very easy. It's a little bit more difficult than this, running a social media ad. You can learn that through a couple YouTube videos, right? You can go to YouTube University and learn that. Now, what's very difficult that very few people can do? That's grow and monetize a $1,000 pay, $100,000 page. So it's very easy to navigate social media. Anybody can do that. It's also relatively easy to run a social media ad for the first time. But to grow and monetize a page to become a $100,000 page, that is very difficult. This is what you can get paid for. This is what you can get paid for. So when you think about all the skills that you have, 
Where do they fit in the skills values matrix? Can somebody take the skill that you have, watch a few YouTube videos, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden get it? And all of a sudden now they say, oh, I'm a social media manager now, right? Can somebody do that? If they can do that, then you need to improve that skill. You need to improve that skill, all right? Dang, we went over an hour, so, um, so Instagram cut off. So let me start that over again. <laughs> we went, we go, we've been going hard today. We're going to be done soon, though. We're going we're gonna to be done in just a second. I got one more paragraph to read. <laughs> All right. Cool. IG, y'all coming back. All right. Yeah. We just got one more paragraph to read, y'all. We lost everybody because we um, uh, we went over an hour on Instagram. All right. So last paragraph, we're on page 252. We're on page 252. Let's say you love social media. Most people think social media is a waste of time from a mass, from a monetary standpoint, but it can be extremely valuable when viewed from the proper perspective. Navigating social media will be in the lower left. Many people can do that, and it's easy. Setting up a social ad would be in the lower right. Most people don't know how to do this, uh, though it is relatively easy to learn. It takes some learning but you can learn how to get an ad up and running in a couple of hours by watching videos on YouTube. It may not be a great ad, but the basics can be learned relatively quickly. Growing a following or fan page or group from zero to 100,000 followers or more would be in the upper right. That takes real skill and it takes time to learn that skill. That's why social media marketing managers can get paid over $100,000 per year. And an even greater skill than that is knowing how to monetize that social media following to create a sustainable online business. There's nothing wrong with loving social media and being on it often. The question is, do you know how to solve difficult problems for others in the environment of social media? The problem is, the question is, do you know how to solve difficult problems for others in the environment of social media? So some of you spend time on social media all day, but you don't get paid for it. You don't get paid for it. So for you, it's a waste of time. There are other people who spend time on social media and they're actually getting paid by you or by the social media platform for being on it. So social media is not a waste of time. It just depends on which side of the equation are you on? Are you a consumer? Or are you a, cre a creator? Where in the Bible does it say God is a consumer? Have you ever called God the consumer? Have you ever called God the consumer? No. We call God the creator. So what are you supposed to be doing on a daily basis? You are supposed to be creating. As a child of God, you are a creator. But advertising, corporate corrupt capitalism, has trained us and programmed us to be consumers as opposed to creators. So now we trade time for money, we get this money, and then we use it to consume. And by the time this body temple dies, you've created nothing except more kids to go through the same exact cycle. All you created is more kids to go through the same exact cycle that you go through or you went through. Instagram cut off because we went over an hour, family. Instagram cut off because we went over an hour. Um, so uh, today we went a little bit long. We are hour and four minutes, um, hour and five minutes in, right? So um, we always have YouTube as the backup. YouTube is always the backup, all right? So you can always jump over to YouTube, all right? So that concludes our reading for today. Rich and Righteous, Spiritual Secrets and Mastering Money Manifestation in Your Mind. Thank you for being here. Um, again, this section on the six forms of capital um, is the longest section in the book. So we're going to break it up over the next three days. So we'll read another five pages tomorrow and we'll get through financial capital. And so, again, we'll be back here at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. Again, that's 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow. All right. I hope this reading has blessed you. I hope you have a blessed and an abundant day. Um, and uh, I thank you for continuing to show up for your consistency. And uh, I, not I hope, I already know.
that transformation is occurring, even if we can't see it. You know, bamboo grows underground for years before it pops above the soil and shoots up. Even if you can't see it yet, I know that your mind is being reprogrammed around money for more abundance. I know that you are stepping into the identity that you are a child of God and that abundance is your birthright. And this is why I keep showing up because I know that your subconscious mind is being rewired and that that just is going to mean a more abundant, rich life for you. And by rich, we do not just mean money. We mean rich in love, rich in joy, rich in family, rich in friends, rich in everything that is good, rich in health. I know that that is coming for you. And so what I would love you to do is in the Facebook group, in the Facebook group, um, if you have a uh, manifestation or testimony that has occurred for you since being here in the morning, I would love for you to share it. I would love for you to share it. If it's too personal, feel free to DM me. Um, but I've gotten some amazing stories from folks uh, in terms of how this work has been working in them and then what they're seeing as a result of it. So please share those stories um, in the Facebook group so that we can inspire others. The Facebook group is facebook.com forward slash groups, plural, forward slash rich and righteous, which is the title of the book. So if you go to Facebook, if you're on YouTube right now, open up another tab, go to Facebook and go to any group that you're in, delete the numbers at the end or the name at the end and type rich and righteous, and then a request access to the group. For those of you who are on Instagram, if you have a computer near you, go ahead and do that right now. Again, it's facebook.com forward slash groups, plural, forward slash rich and righteous request access to the group. Any testimonies, any stories, please share them. What, uh, what I have been seeing in the Facebook group is people sharing uh, books that have been mailed to them by other people who are here, people who bought the set of five and were looking for someone to give to. Um, and that's really inspiring. We're creating our own economy that is more valuable than just the exchange of money. We're creating our own economy with just these books alone. This is why this book is colored like money, right? This is currency. And this is actually more valuable. This knowledge in here, wealth consciousness is more valuable than the actual tangible representation of wealth. Knowing how to create wealth is more valuable than wealth itself, right? And so when you give a book to another person, right? When you circulate it, you're, you're circulating wealth consciousness, right? We are here to teach people how to fish, not just to give them fish. When you give them fish, you leave them in a state of poverty because they have to always rely on you. That's a codependent relationship. But when you teach them how to fish, they can now go fish for their own self and they can teach other people how to fish. This is what we're doing. So though we may only be 600 people here right now, I know that those 600 people are now sharing this wealth consciousness with other another 600 people, which then can share with another 600 people. This is how we become the wealthiest family in the world. It's going to take time. and uh, But time is a man-made thing. I'm just going to keep showing up in the here and now, in the here and now, in the here and now. And for us right now, that here and now is 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every single weekday. All right. So I will see you tomorrow. Please set a phone alarm uh, on your phone to be here. And uh, we'll continue our reading of the six forms of capital tomorrow. All right. Everybody have a great day. Love y'all. Talk to you soon. Peace. Yeah, YouTube, like this on your way out. If you haven't liked the video already, uh, like it on your way out, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.